Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the bullpen. Yep, in the bullpen today, we have Mr. Travis Nix, associate contributor, Young Voices, also a current JD candidate at Georgetown Law with a concentration in tax law. Welcome to the show, how are you? I'm good, thank you so much for having me. Well, listen, man, you and I both are currently in law school. So, uh, you know, did you make your first year? I did. Glad it was to be doing, uh, <laughs> glad, to make, glad to make it to the second year for sure. Yeah, it's like a hazing process, is it not? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> All right, brother, congratulations on your studies, okay? Thank you. Um, we're gonna chop it up about the Build Back Better plan and general taxation rules as it relates to left leaning, right leaning policies. I don't wanna presume what you know or believe about those items. So if you would give us your sentiment. Yeah, when you're talking about tax policy, you're really talking about two different things. One, you're talking about the tax base. That's measuring who's paying the taxes and what types of income we are taxing. And then we have tax rates, which is obviously the percentage of um, taxable income that people pay in taxes. So when we're talking about tax policy, my general principles are that we need a broad tax base. We need to eliminate deductions to really uh, neutralize the tax code to make sure that government is not picking winners and losers in the economy that promotes economic growth and does good things for the economy. But then when we do broaden the tax base by eliminating deductions, we need to, we need to drastically lower tax rates to spur investment, lower the cost of capital, especially on businesses. And the only bill in history to do that is the 2017 Tax Cuts and Jobs Act versus what the Democrats are currently proposing is to have a very narrow tax base, have minimum taxes that only 45 corporations in America pay and have a small handful of billionaires paying taxes. And then they're gonna increase tax rates. That goes against all principles of good tax policy. Let's talk about taxation as a regressive element. Uh, do you believe that the taxation process in the United States of America, Democrats and Republicans, it has largely been used as a regressive policy for most uh, in the country? Or do you see it differently? No, we have a very progressive tax code in the United States. For example, 40%. Uh, 40% of all income taxes are paid by the top 1% of income earners. 97% of all taxes in the US are paid by the top 50% of income earners. We have a much more progressive system than let's say countries like the UK, which has their top rates or top rates start at a much lower income level than the US. And they also fund government programs through consumption taxes, which are a lot more progressive than the income taxes that the US federal government relies on for a bulk of their tax revenue. Let me bring some specifics to your front door. Because I do think there are some regressive elements and it harshly penalizes those who are poor on the economic scale than it should be. Let me give an example. So a family for home care cost out of pocket currently pays about $1,500 per year just for four hours of home care per week. Uh, currently, there is no um, plan, there is no federal program that would assist that family. And the deduction ratio is so low that most of them receive nothing in a payback for uh, paying for that child care expense. But the Build Back Better plan says this is something we need to remedy. This is something we've overlooked for a very long time. COVID-19 has exposed the reality or the cause and effects relate cause and effect relationship between people that need to work who are parents and the cost of health care, right? So it creates an ecosystem response where now because we never did solve this issue for those who are essential workers, those essential workers who never got essential pay, they don't go to work, not because they can't work, not because they don't want to work, but because they can't afford childcare. And now you have other systems that are adversely impacted because of that. My point to you is, it's not just the taxation policy, it's also connected to the ecosystem of how the taxation policy interrupts the life beyond that to where a person who doesn't have as much disposable income ends up having a regressive policy as it relates to childcare. That's in the act, the Build Back Better 
uh, program. Do you agree or disagree with that element of the act? I disagree with it and I don't think it would have any impact on getting people with young children back to work. Um, Jason Furman, uh, the chairman of President Obama's um, economic council, he just a few months ago released a study and it showed that paid family leave will have zero impact on people working. Uh, I disagree with Mr. Furman on a lot of tax policy, but he is absolutely right here. There's very little evidence that paid family leave programs um, will get people back to working. And we do have a tax code getting back to taxes and not spending for a second. We do have a tax code that does help family and that does subsidize a little bit of um, families childcare. We have a child tax credit that the Republicans doubled in the 2017 tax bill and also increased the refundable portion of it to make sure that um, families who don't pay income mm -hmm. taxes still receive a portion a large portion of the child tax credit that yeah, does but it's not enough. help them subsidize their care. Yeah, it's not enough. So let me make sure I'm right on what you're saying. You're saying that um, the money that would be allowed to come back to families under the Build Back Better program for expenses related to child care. You're saying that this would have zero impact on the job market or a person's ability uh, to work freely in the economy. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I'll have minimum to zero. Um, Mr. Furman's paper put that out. The Joint Economic Committee this week mm -hmm. released a paper that showed a similar thing. And I think the crux of it is, okay, who's not working because of childcare? It's, it's mothers. And a lot of studies show that a lot of mothers with children do not wanna work. It's one thing to say somebody doesn't want to work. But the reality is in this country, most mothers do actually work. Uh, they have some level of employment. So you can't cite a study about what somebody wants no. to do. We're talking about actual data. So cite to me something that's an actual data set. Yeah, yeah. in 2019, Gallup uh, released a poll saying that 50% of mothers with children under 18 do not want to work. They want to stay home with their children. But they all work. Gallup poll. They don't all work. But they are working. Okay, wait a minute. Brother, you just said to me oh. that a Gallup poll said 50% of mothers don't want to work, right? Yeah, which means your variable, right, which means your variable is what? Your variable is mothers who are working with children. They don't want no. to work. No, the poll measured mothers with people un, with children under the age of. Were those 18. mothers working mothers or not? Uh, it, there was a cross sample of that. I assume it was based on percentage of working mothers that do work and don't work. I assume Gallup has a good sample for both of them to accurately right, that's an reflect assumption. the demographics of the US. That, that's an assumption that I would like you to research if you're gonna cite the numbers. Let me give you another number, okay, 44%. 44% of black mothers say that their ability or inability to hire childcare or to pay for childcare expenses adversely impacts their ability to go to college or to work. When you say that it would have a zero or very minimal impact, explain that to the black women who are cited in the survey. Now, here's the other part. It's interesting to me that we say, okay, these policies won't have any impact whatsoever. Literally 16% of school teachers during the height of COVID-19 said that they couldn't even go to school and work because they could not afford childcare for their own children at home. You have to understand this, they couldn't afford childcare at home because every daycare center was still shut down while schools were starting to reopen. That's 16% of educators, National Association of Educators, you can find it. So tell me how, are you still proclaiming that it would have zero impact based on some study when we have actual bona fide evidence of people that it has adversely impacted? That's not empirical evidence. That's evidence based on a few stories. No, that's not. Maybe Wait, hold the, on. No, maybe for no, sir, you are absolutely incorrect by that citation. That is that that's not only empirical. That is experiential. 
That's experiential evidence. That means it has already happened. You don't need a theory or a study or survey. This is what has already happened. These are real human beings that have had this experience and they have taken this experience, done a survey and said to the government, you need to change this part of it. It would help us out or it would have helped us out if this policy was already in place. Why are you still depending on the study when you actually have the evidence, brother? I don't understand that. Well, maybe we shouldn't have closed. Maybe states shouldn't have closed down daycares. And then we have other evidence. Well, that's a different example, argument. Yeah, there's a there's also polling data that shows that 70% of working mothers would also rather stay home with their child and provide parental or relative care to their children instead of sending them to daycare centers. You know what the centers. problem is with your argument, brother? You keep talking about what mothers would like to do and in a perfect world they can. But we live in a very imperfect society where women are making 60 cent on the dollar as the, as their male counterparts in the workplace, being similarly educated with similar experience. We have an active political class that opposes equal pay for equal work. So mothers are forced to make ends meet. So you can argue what mothers would like to do, I'm all for it. I'm Hell, I'm all for anyone who would like to spend more time with their children. But you're not arguing the data back with me, you're arguing sentiment. The reality is the data is codified, it's clear. The data says that those who have expenses, especially related to childcare, would be better off in the work market that they have to work in to make ends meet if there was a level of subsidy beyond what it is. How do we debate that? That's what they are telling us. They've already said that to us, brother. Yeah, but I think there's different ways to go around that than doing paid family leave, which the studies show won't have any impact, and doing other types of subsidizing childcare like universal pre-K that working women according to the data shows that they do not want to use. So I think there's other ways to get around it. For example, we can have a universal child allowance that Mitt Romney proposed that would consolidate all these different tax programs that benefit low income earners with children. Let's consolidate those and get closer to a universal child care program. That's a Republican proposal that was revenue neutral. That's one way to help working families and put more money in their pockets. Tell me this man, what's your beef with um, family leave, what, what is your issue with it? I think the data shows that it will not uh, help children and that it will not be used. It's a okay. subsidy and it'll grow over time and that you're using um, very narrow tax bases to pay for a program that will, um, that, will that will just cost more to the government over time, lead to more national debt and higher inflation rates that Americans are so struggling with right now. Come on, brother, you're a taxation concentration guy. Uh, what adds, what is the number one catalyst for inflation? Uh, it's right now, it's probably supply chain issues. It is always 100% of the time, it's the cost of manufacturing, which creates a supply chain is, uh, issue. You have to pay more for the cost and the consumer market drives, it becomes the catalyst for the inflation. You can't tell me that a social program uh, is the primary factor for inflation. Why do you guys try that? Why y'all no. always try to make that argument when 100% of the time when we've had inflation in the, in the United States, it was because of the cost of manufacturing that the, that was the catalyst behind it. Come on, man. When government debt rises and deficit rise, rise, you have to pay that debt, which raises interest rates, which, cause, which causes inflation to grow over time. Right now with inflation, <laughs> we're talking about most likely temporary measures, mm -hmm. but with the amount of government spending that can create uh, demand pull inflation. Who holds the record for government spending? Uh, right now, probably President Trump. Yeah, and how long does it take for inflation to set in into a general economy? Uh, a very long time. It does. So if you're saying that a program today will create inflation today, uh, you're no, literally say, saying- I never said inflation today, I said Okay, so you're saying it, it'll create inflation 20 years from now or 10 years from now, that's what you're saying, right? Yeah. Yeah, it'll, okay. you'll put inflation and raise prices on your kids and grandkids. Okay, um, let me be very clear about some of the benefits of the uh, Paid Family Leave Act. Um, number one, it ensures that there's a protection for the family unit um, for those who need to take that time. 
and really other industrial nations, they have prioritized people over profit in this arena. Usually when you all come to the argument about Family Leave Act or Family Leave Time, the argument is a money argument. Here's the thing, man. And I want you to hear me on this, brother, because you're a sharp guy and, and I think you're gonna do great things in life. Government is not a company. And I wanna say that again. Government is not a company, it's not a corporation. The government makes no money. All the money the government has, it came from us. Yeah. It came from us because we want the government to do some things that are people centric and not just profit centric. So yes, it does cost money, it costs more money to invest into human capital, to invest into your human infrastructure, but it's worth it. It's worth it for work morale, it's worth it for spending time with their child, it's worth it to have the additional income to do exactly what needs to be done. It's worth it on all of those arenas, all of those fronts, it's worth it. But don't you find it ironic, brother, that you have never heard anybody go before Congress and argue, it would be great to go to war with Iraq or Iran or wherever, but we just don't have it in the budget. We have unlimited money to kill people and blow things up. It's called the Department of Defense spending. But all of a sudden when it comes to these domestic social programs that takes the money that they took from us to invest it back into us as working citizens, all of a sudden there's an argument about how much it costs. When it, it, it is barely a fraction of what we spend to kill people around the nation or around this globe. You don't find that ironic? No, the, the defense budget is an important part of American national security, American foreign policy. It's very important that we have a national defense, especially right now when China is talking about invading our one of our best allies in Taiwan. Do you know how much it's we spend important. on defense? Do you know how much, what, what's the percentage? 900 billion a year. And how much of that 900 billion is actually spent on defense, do you know? Uh, it, it, it depends how you define defense. Okay. Defense is actual defense of the country. We're not talking about major contractors building this or building that or experimental programs or projects to, but just think about it, man. The vast majority of it doesn't go to defense spending. You, you're aware of that. Yeah, it goes to protecting America's national interests around the world. You're we falling for most- it, Travis, you're falling for it, man. You're falling for it. Here's what I would love for you to do. Because I actually think you would agree with me on this when you look at the itemization of defense spending, what they have called defense spending. They call it defense spending so you don't peep under the hood. They don't want you to look at what they're actually spending the money on. Over 80% of what they call defense spending is not defense spending at all. And I encourage you, just look under the hood, brother. Look under the hood and look at the itemization. And next time you come back on the show, let's talk about what they're actually spending our tax dollars on and if you agree with it, okay? Yeah, I mean, there's government spent, the government wastes money. I'm not out here to say that there is no wasteful spending going on in the Pentagon. There is, because the government, especially the US government, loves to waste money. All right, on that we agree. All right, brother, I appreciate you being on the show. My producers are telling me I'm out of time. Uh, man, good luck to you in your status. I hope you come back. I appreciate you being on the show today. And, um, you know, we'll talk again, man, okay? Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Absolutely.